one. I'm not getting anything. Are you getting a, a start? I'm not getting our intro. I don't hear anything. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, BTR, for, uh, again, screwing us up. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see if we can find our intro. Come on. And dear show open. Here we go. <laughs> Conservative talk, you come to the right place. That's the wrong one. Thank you, BTR, for getting us really messed up first thing in the morning. Try this one. Welcome to Southern Sense Talk Radio with your host, the radio chick, Annie Ubellis. Join Annie on Tuesdays and Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with an open chat room full of her regulars. And yes, you can even call in. Call 917-889-3675. That's 917-889-3675 to be a part of the action on the phone line. Not able to listen live? Not a problem. You can always catch Annie. The Radio Chick and Southern Sense Talk Radio podcast in archives at southern-sense.com. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Southern Sense the right way. Oh, thank God it's Friday. It's Friday, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. Then it has to be Southern Sense here on Blog Talk Radio, High Plains Media, SHR Media, the Kinetic Hi-Fi, the Fix FM out of Charleston, South Carolina, as well as iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, and all the heck with it. You know what I'm going to say next? Of course, I say it every single show. Just go to our website. Check it out. It's the name of the show. Put a dash in the middle. Southern-Sense.com. I'm your hostess with the most, just the radio chick, Annie, along with my debonair and intellectual co-host, Curtis C.S. Bennett. Good afternoon, Curtis. As always, I... Last thing I said before we went on the air live, let's hope nothing else goes wrong. Uh, of course, what happens? The opening of the show goes all wrong. <laughs> well, you know, you have those those kind of days every once in a while. Things just don't go right. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, uh, there's got to be a better way to do this because uh, it's not working out. But uh, thank you for those that are listening in uh, and I want to give a special shout out to our friend, Sweet Sue from New Mexico, who tirelessly works with all the other shows here on Blog Talk Radio, especially mine when she puts it out up there in Twitter. And we want to thank her for all the hard work she does. We got a lot going on today. We're supposed to have Stacy on the right be calling in. She'll be our first guest. So I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, but then Jennifer Carroll will be calling in at the half hour. And we'll see who else pops up. Right, Curtis? Hey, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, <laughs> we've we got a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the world today, especially in our political world. So I'm yeah. up for it. And we've got another WikiLeaks dump. And uh, it's getting messier and messier. I have never in my entire life thought I would see a political campaign go down in the dirt like this is. You know, I'd like to see Trump. And it's like the focus. Yeah, I'd like to see Trump That's stop okay. being defensive, stop talking about the bull crap, and talk about the issues. If he talks about illegal immigration, if he talks about the border, if he talks about the refugee resettlement program, if he talks about jobs, if he talks about the important things that people are honestly worrying about, than whether or not he tried to kiss a woman 30 years ago. Talk about substance and get back on track and tell us how you're going to make America great again. I don't want to hear the other bull crap. Talk about the lack of security that we had with the Secretary of State that put our nation's security in jeopardy. That's a substantial, substantial issue. Let's talk about what's real to the American people. See, I want him to talk more about Hillary myself and and mm -hmm. the, the the situation she's gotten us in, you know, with her lies and her backroom dealings and 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 overseas um, funding, you know, for her foundation. 
we don't, we, we're not going to hear it from the uh, mainstream media, so he has to do it. He has to be our mouthpiece. Yeah, and now Breitbart put out that there's even more damning evidence that the Obama administration was actually helping the terrorists gain weapons, weapons to use against our own men and women. That is coming out in the in the email dumps. Thank you to John Podesta for you know, talking about this in the email. So now we know what is out there. So tell me why, <laughs> why isn't the FBI prosecuting her? Oh, that's right. Her crony pals in charge of the FBI, James Comey, who let her go on Whitewater, who let them go on the Mark Rich pardon, who let them go on the emails. Oh, and everyone was saying, James Comey, he's a Republican. He's going to be fair. He'll be honest. You know what I want to say ne- next, yeah. and it's it, oh, it's going to be four-letter <laughs> words. Yeah. Oh, Just man. like John Robert. <laughs> you know, there's but, so, but much, anyway. so much stink coming out of Washington, D.C., yeah. and the media is compliant with it. And it looks like we may not have Stacy joining us. Ah, oh, man. Well, if she does call in, we'll interrupt and bring her on. So we're going to start go back to our normal programming here and to start off with the dedication, if that's all right with you, Curtis. Yeah, and you know, she may have been impacted by the um, storm. I don't know what her power situation is, so that could mm-hmm. be a possibility, too. She may not have power back on. Well, that is also a possibility. Uh, we'll, well, we'll find out <laughs> as we go along. Uh, that said, those that listen to the show know that we do start off with a dedication to a fallen hero. And once again, it's another law enforcement officer who's fallen in the line of duty. It goes out to Sergeant Kerry Winters of Ulster County Sheriff's Office, New York. His end of watch was Thursday, September 22nd of this year, and his cause of death was drowning. And let me pull up the dedication song if I can find it. There we go. All right. This is from The Daily Freeman. Sergeant Kerry Winters was someone you'd want to dive with. Somebody that had your back, said Ulster County Sheriff Paul Van Blackham. Winters, 51, was a 30-year veteran of the Sheriff's Office who died Thursday, September 22nd after being found unconscious during an in-water dive training exercise on the Ash Oaken Reservoir in Olive, New York. The sergeant, an experienced and accomplished diver, was wearing full dive gear and a backup air supply when the accident occurred, the sheriff said. At this point, we have not found any equipment issues, he said. Van Blackham, who knows Winters for Sergeant's entire career, said Winters joined the department as a corrections officer on June 27, 1986, and worked his way up. Winters was promoted to corporal and then to sergeant, and he worked under three sheriffs, Michael LaPaglia, J. Richard Blockelman, and Van Blackham. Ulster County Superintendent of Corrections, Jim Hanston, said Winters worked in the jail for his entire career and handled intake at the Kingston facility. He was the one behind the scene guys that didn't get half the credit they deserve, Hanstein said. The superintendent said he first met Winters when he was in his 20s. He was a big, strong guy with a real zest for life and an extremely contagious laugh. A great giggle, Hanstein said. It will be something I'll miss. Winters was one of the original members of the Sheriff's Emergency Response Team, once served as the department's grievous coordinator, and was a 15-year veteran of the dive team, Van Blarkham said. As a dive member, Hanstein said, Winters was on 24-hour call. While on the dive team, Winters was involved in numerous recoveries of bodies and evidence and involved in numerous swift water rescues. During the storms, Sandy and Irene, Sergeant Winters and his team performed over 30 rescues. Van Blarkham said Winters lived in Saugaties with his wife, Michelle, and two sons. All he ever talked about was his wife and kids. That was the center of his universe, Hanstein said. The cause of Winters' death remains under investigation, and we're awaiting medical tests. He said the state police and Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration will participate in the investigation. 
Winters had no ongoing medical problems the sheriff knew of and was a big, strong bear of a guy. Van Blarkham said Winters was missing for less than five minutes when the search and rescue effort began. He was taken to Alliance Health Alliance Hospital in Broadway Campus in Kingston by the Olive Rescue Squad and pronounced dead a short time later. In a statement on its Facebook page, the Kingston Police Department offered condolences to our brothers and sisters at the Ulster County Sheriff's Office and especially to the family of Sergeant Kerry Winters. Many of us at the Kingston Police Department had worked with Sergeant Winters at some point in our career or would see him in our station when he would stop by on court days. He will be missed. And this is also from the Freeman. More than 1,000 law enforcement personnel and their emergency responders lined Route 9W to pay respects to the Ulster County Sheriff Sergeant Kerry Winters, whose death served as a reminder to them that their jobs came with risks. A funeral procession led by police on motorcycles brought Winters' casket to St. Joseph Roman's Catholic Church in Saugatees for a funeral mass. The casket was carried from the hearse to the church by Winters' fellow members of the Sheriff's Office dive team. About 150 people attended the Mass, while more than 100 stood outside the church. After the Mass, Winters' casket was driven along right Route 9W to St. Mary of the Snow Cemetery in nearby Barclay Heights, where he was laid to rest. Members of more than 30 agencies some from well outside the mid-Hudson Valley, stood along the route to pay tribute. The reality of this job is what it is, said Green County Sheriff's Deputy J.R. Del Vecchio. The reality of last week's accident drives it home. You never know when the time is up. You never know you cannot make it home. Today's show is dedicated to Sergeant Kerry Winters of Ulster County, New York. It is also dedicated to all those first responders out there who every day don their uniforms and protect and serve selflessly. And to all the brave men and women in our military, to those that have served, who are serving, and will serve. God bless them all. We dedicate this song, Last Call, by Dave Bray, to all of them. Oh, 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 oh,
cutting the dedication a little short because we do have our guest back here with us as I bring this to an end and we will play the rest of the dedication later on in the show. You're here listening to Southern Sense here on Blog Talk Radio, High Plains Media, SHR Media, The Fix FM out of Charleston, South Carolina. I'm your hostess with the mostest, the radio chick Annie, along with my co-host and author Curtis C.S. Bennett. Let's welcome aboard our our guest, that's, she's going to have to leave in a few minutes, so that's why I'm cutting things short. Let's welcome aboard Stacy on the right. Stacy Washington, how are you today? Oh, wait, wait, we got to unmute her. Dang, I am really <laughs> messing up today. Sorry about that, Stacy. <laughs> Doing too many things at the same hey guys, time. how are you? <laughs> All right, I'm fine. You know what, I got to say, you don't love me anymore because you used to send things to me on Facebook, not Facebook, Twitter. And then I sent you a message about coming on the show. You ignored me. And then I turned around and said, did you get the phone number to call in? And you ignore me. I feel so hurt. <laughs> um, okay. I'm, I'm not sure if I saw all of those with all the messages that I get. I don't usually respond to everything. So but let, what, what do you want to talk about today? Oh, man, what is not to talk about? I just want to let people know who you are. You've got your own website called StacyOnTheRight.com, and you broadcast out of 97.1 FM News Talk KFTK. Did I get that right? KFTK. Yeah, I got that right. As well as, you know, um, we've had several of your fellow members from Project 21 on the show. We've got so much to talk about. You've got the war between Trump and and Hillary. And my entire life, my first election I voted in was 1976. I have never seen anything down in the dirt and muddy as this. Yeah, it's been pretty rough, but it's mainly because our focus has been placed incorrectly on conversations and things that were supposed to be kept private with Donald Trump. As disgusting as the comments were, they were in a private conversation um, and what we're not talking about, the voter fraud, I have a video on Facebook where I outline all of the recent cases of voter fraud on the Democrat side, where they're literally um, using absentee ballot fraud, they're registering dead voters, dead voters have been shown to have voted in six of the past elections, including the midterm. So there's a lot there. It's a huge story. It's as big as the email scandal or bigger because Uh, Voter integrity impacts all citizens. The dilution of votes is something that we should all be concerned about. And I'm just looking at this, and I'm wondering why CNN, MSNBC, and all of the others aren't covering it. You hear about it on Fox News, but the majority of the conversation, to the tune of 13 minutes for the WikiLeaks revelations from Friday night, and 198 minutes of airtime have been devoted to Trump's comments from 11 years ago. So they definitely don't want us talking about Hillary's policies or these scandals that are plaguing the Democrats right now. You know, it was really powerful because Sean Hannity had Juanita Broderick, uh, Paula Jones, and oh, I forgot the name of the other woman. I apologize. But he had them on his show. 
And it, when you look at the original interview you did with her, it is hard to not cry when you listen to Juanita Broderick. Now, how can you compare what occurred with the Clinton family and Hillary uh, helping him to cover this up? So she becomes actually as criminal culp- as criminally culpable as him as an accessory after the fact. No one's addressing that. But <laughs> trying to kiss a woman 30 years ago does not raised to the same level of an actual rape. I, I don't understand why the, the press is not he- looking at this. Yeah, it's um, their election of duty. It's not surprising, but in light of how close we are to the election and how badly Hillary was doing before in the polls before the actual revelations about Trump's comments, you can see how desperate the Democrats are, and I just hope that Americans will focus in on what the policies are that they're supporting, because in reality, you're voting for the Democrats' policies in Hillary Clinton, or you're voting for the Republicans' policies in Donald Trump. And although he's not a conventional candidate, and he hasn't been a Republican as long as, say, someone like Mitt Romney or John McCain were, he is the representative for our party, and we can hold his feet to the fire through Congress and through the midterms and all of the things that we try to utilize against the president. Only this time, it's on our side. So we really need to be cognizant of how much more important it is that our platform is where we place our confidence when it comes to who we're voting for. Well, this is what Curtis and I were discussing before you came on the air with us, uh, is that we want to hear more substance. We don't want to hear about Donald Trump's locker room talk. We don't want to hear him attacking about the women that made the allegations. I want to hear what he's going to do about jobs. I want to hear what he's going to do yeah. about immigration. I want to hear what he's going to do about the refugee resettlement. I want to hear what he's going to do about the attacks on us by terrorists, by jihad, by Islamic terrorists. I want to hear those words. I don't want to hear him turn around and attack the woman who's making these allegations. Let the courts you know, sort that out if they're going to bring charges against him. You know, I want to hear what so people do to, to say make thank us. Thank you for having me on today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be with you. Oh, it has been. Thank and hopefully, you. we can get you to hear longer next time. Okay, that was Stacy Washington, and I. She had to run. All right, Curtis, it's you and I again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it comes to um, defense and weapon technology, I always tell Obama suspect because a couple of years ago <clears throat> on his first term we lost um I believe it was uh, um a drone a highly sophisticated drone and it fell somewhere in Iran or near Iran and our military you know brass requested permission to, to destroy it you know we could have sent a plane to um bomb that um that drone and Obama denied it. So guess what? That technology ended up in the hands of the Iranians. So ever since then, I kind of understood, you know, what side the guy was working for. Well, you know, if you look at the recent WikiLeap dump, dumps on the emails, I was starting to talk about this earlier. It was in Breitbart that um, Hillary Clinton received classified intelligence reports stating that the Obama administration was actively supporting al-Qaeda in Iraq, the terrorist group that became the Islamic State. The memo made clear that al-Qaeda in Iraq was speaking with Mohammed al-Adani, who is now the uh, senior spokesman for the Islamic State, also known as ISIS. Western and Gulf states were supporting the terrorist group to try to overthrow the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, who was propped up by the Russians, Iranians, and Chinese. In a 2012 secret classified memo that was sent to various top Obama administration officials and agencies, including the State Department and Clinton's office personally. The report identifies al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, as being one of the principal elements of the Syrian opposition, which the West was choosing to support. So we were sending arms directly to our enemies to take down the Syrian president. Now, does this make any sense? You're se- giving the very arms to our enemies to kill us. And where do you he- hear CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC? Do you hear any of them talking about this? 
And let's not forget the Humvees, the hundreds of Humvees and trucks they got. We could have bombed that well, how broad they, daylight. And well, how much did they leave around behind? Our equipment. But how much did, of that equipment did they leave behind in Iraq when we left? They did it in the first Gulf War, and they did it in the operations the second Gulf War. When we pulled out of Iraq, tons of material was left behind that our enemies were able to utilize. I mean, how many times have we built a, a base in either Afghanistan or Pakistan, turned it over to them only to have the enemies overrun them and take them away from the government? You know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, folks. No, actually, we've got a loaded yeah. pistol to our head, and we're helping our enemies to pull the trigger. And no one is talking about it. And you know what else is scary, Annie? Mm-hmm. We we have reports of um, dozens of Iranians and Syrians that came here for training, and nobody knows where they are. You know, they just disappeared once they got here. Well, we've been talking about this, that there are a lot of also Saudis, Saudi workers on our military bases, they were contracted to come here to work on the basis, so they are these H-1B-1 government employees, and they get to the mm-hmm. base, and they disappear. They disappear. No one knows where they went. David Gobetz wrote about this. Uh, he has it in his book, Muslim Mafia. Uh, we've been talking about this with Mike Cutler. Mike Cutler will be joining us. Uh, when is he coming back on? He's on the 21st. He'll be with us. And no one is checking these people with these H-1B-1 visas. You know, they walk onto a military base and no one sees them leave. No one knows where they go. Are they still on the base? Did they sneak off the base? Are they now somewhere buried in our society waiting to launch a jihad attack on us? Who are these people? But no one's asking the questions. And that's disappointing. That is highly disappointing. And you have to wonder what they're up to. I mean, we I think early this year or the end of last year, there were like two or three at some um, base that disappeared. And you heard it in the news for about one or two days, and after that, it was shut down. Everything about that incident was shut down on the news. No, it's, so, it is a shame. And we, actually... Well, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like, you know... We're inviting in a Trojan horse. Yeah, <laughs> Trojan horse. It's a Trojan tank. It's a Trojan nuke. And, oh my goodness, Vito posted something that's hysterical uh, up in the chat room. I want to thank Vito for that. Uh, it seems like uh, Peter decided to use uh, <laughs> some language, <laughs> Trumpian language, as he puts it, uh, and is under fire. Uh, there's a he put up the article, which is from heatstreet.com, uh, and it's <laughs> apologizing, Peter, because the ad says, grab a pussy, meaning, you know, to rescue an animal, rescue your cat or something like that. But it came off <laughs> a little wrong <laughs> in light wow. of Trump's comment. <laughs> it just, <laughs> oops. <laughs> I think it's funny. I honestly think it's funny, yeah. especially since I've got six cats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that is just too funny. That is absolutely too funny. You know, there's so many things. We're waiting for uh, former Florida Lieutenant Governor Jennifer Carroll to uh, call into the show. Um, it seems like our guests are leaving us high and dry here today, Curtis. Uh, so I'm going to just start pulling articles up that uh, I had pulled out and printed up. Um, Trump. Yeah, I, I think she's calling in um, at two thirty, I believe. Okay. Well, you know, Trump has been sending out all these email blasts, and I don't know if anyone else that's listening in is on his email list. But I ended up opening up my mail, and there's like ten of them sitting there, one right after another, after another. And most of my delete, and some of them I just happened to open up and say, "All right, fine." This one looks a little interesting. Um, he put out a statement, and this is from her, his communications uh, advisor, Jason Miller. Uh, there appears to have been an article in Newsweek about an interview Trump allegedly did with the Serbian Weekly magazine. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce this magazine. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but it turns out it was a complete hoax. 
and they're asking Newsweek to print a retraction. He writes, Mr. Trump never gave an interview to the Serbian weekly magazine, blah, 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 whatever it is, as falsely reported by the discredited Newsweek, nor was such an interview conducted through our Indiana state director. This was a hoax, and we look forward to receiving a formal retraction and apology from all involved. Signed, Jason Miller, Senior Communications Advisor. Then it's followed up with, and this is, quote, Regarding the article about media interview with a Serbian politician and Mr. Trump via my email, this is completely false. I have never served as a conduit to interview Mr. Trump for anyone, unquote, by Susie Jorowski, the Indiana state director. And I probably mispronounced her last name, too. So, you know, it's it's some of the stuff they're coming up with that just throwing it out there and seeing what will stick and what he will catch and what he will punch back at. I honestly, I have never, I, I'm going to say it over and over again until I'm blue in the face, but I've never seen an election cycle like this before. I've never seen the mudslinging, the down and dirty fights, never in my entire yeah. life. And now as these email yeah. leaks are coming out on Clinton, it's getting worse and worse where you see direct collusion between the media and the Trump campaign. And I think that was Jennifer Cowell just trying to call in just now. And she dropped off. It looks like we're having oh, one man. of those days, Curtis, definitely. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, but what gets me is the um, polls. You know, I, 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 I hear the polls on television. But then I read about something like Rasmussen poll has um, Trump leading Hillary by three or four points. But you never hear that on te- you know, the television news. So right. you don't know what to believe. Well, we've got a call coming in from California, area code 818. You're on the air live with Southern Sense. I'm your host, Annie, the radio chick, along with my co-host, Curtis C.S. Bennett. To whom am I speaking? Hi, this is uh, Bobby in Los Angeles, the greatest caller in the history of radio. Hi, Bobby. We're waiting for our guest to call in, so I'm going to have you just listen in so that she can have the line free. Thank you for uh, calling you're in. you're chicken shit. You don't want... <laughs> I, I love it. I'm being hit by these trolls left and right lately. Uh, and we are waiting for a Florida uh, former Lieutenant Governor Jennifer Carroll to call in. She should be calling in momentarily. And, uh, oh, man, now I just lost my train. Oh, we were talking about the WikiLeaks and the emails. Um, and the poll, yeah. Yeah. The, I've said this before. These polls can be fixed any way they want. It depends upon how they ask the question and who they ask the question of. And there was one that was up on uh, on Media Center. I forget. I think it was that or Daily Caller. I forget. And they pulled the poll apart and they showed that uh, when they looked to see exactly who was taking the poll, they had at that point it was 45% were registered and voting Democrats. Uh, I think something like 10% were leaning Democrat and they had a percentage that were independent. And then of the Republicans, voting Republicans, they polled. They had 24%. Now, how do you think that poll is going to skew if you got 45% of voting Democrats versus 24% of voting Republicans? Of course, it's going to show that the Democrats would prefer uh, would show that you know they're favoring and Hillary's winning. When in reality, when you look at the actual uh, rallies that are going on, Hillary barely gets a couple hundred. Where well, you've got thousands. Um, the last uh, stadium he what was the last rally he had was something like forty one hundred people. Forty one hundred people compared yeah. to a hundred. So you know it's it's skewing. It, they're, they're skewing the polls to make the voters think that this is going to be the outcome. And I'm saying it's going to be a dewy moment. Come election morning, uh, when the Republicans go out in mass and really do vote and take the states that are coloring purple and turn them completely red. Yeah. And the following day or that night, when all the media goes out there, it's going to be, oh, no, it was supposed to be Hillary that won. And the newspapers will have the headline, Hillary wins, when in reality, it's Donald Trump sitting in the White House. It's going to be a dewy moment. Look what they did with Brexit, yeah. Curtis, how they predicted Brexit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they, they, they were wrong on that one. 
Oh, what absolutely. Well, absolutely, completely wrong on saying, that one. What I was saying, was going to say, they, they're piling up on the left on Donald Trump big time, especially um, shows like uh, MSNBC and uh, CNN. I heard a woman um, consultant on CNN the other day said, said that um, Hillary was going to you know, win by a landslide. So, you know, they, they make it sound like, you know, Trump has no hope in this right now. And I think it's to depress Trump's supporters and, you know, discourage them. And I don't think it's going to work. No, it's not going to work. And uh, since I'm, I'm just going to make a comment out there because I know this individual still listening in. You know, I do pay for my subscription on here. It is my show. I control the content. And I also control who I allow to call in and speak on the show, including who appears in my chat room. If you don't like it, go bother someone else because I will continue to ignore you. That said, <laughs> all right, <laughs> you know, this is this is the problem the left have. They don't want to have a decent conversation. They don't want to have a logical conversation, you know, because you notice just before I muted him, I was called a chicken shit. No, that's not having a civil conversation and having you come into the chat room and insult me is also not civil conversation. So that said, you can go and bother someone else. I don't care how many times you try calling in and how many times you try annoying me. I'm not going to put up with it. Period. <sighs> okay. That was my rant for the yeah, day. It seems like, things are, seems like things are getting stranger as we approach Halloween. Ah, yeah, that is true. And the closer we get to Halloween, the more the clowns come out. So <laughs> must be that lunar, the, the lunar effect. <laughs> uh huh. It, it has to be the lunar effect. Uh, but I do see a former lunar co-host lunar. sitting in the queue. And cool, Mike, if you want to come in and join the conversation, because our guests uh, <laughs> are gone, <laughs> and we're <laughs> twiddling our thumbs here, <laughs> so. We can find out how you're doing with your campaign, too. You know, uh, going back to the, um, this is from Washington Times, of all places, that wrote the article about the fix being in. And this is, I'm looking to see who wrote this. Good Lord. Because I do like to credit the author. And they don't have the author on here. So I will say Washington Times title is Hillary Clinton. The fix is in. And they wrote Exhibit A is mainstream media. Major telephone networks and cable news networks are the and the largest print publications are all advocating for Hillary Clinton. Each picks and chooses what stories to report and which to ignore. Case in point is the recent dueling scandals. Um, within two hours of the Trump story, WikiLeaks unloaded thousands of emails that showed Clinton speeches where she said she'd like to open the borders and open trade. All right. The communication where she says that Jordan can't possibly vet all the refugees from Syria and acknowledges that it, that jihadists are coming in along with legitimate refugees. These are all things he, she said. And emails, uh, including the intention to dampen the Second Amendment via executive order. But the media is not talking about what she said. But instead, as Stacy pointed out earlier, uh, the beginning of this week, the major networks had spent 198 minutes of news time talking about Trump and his offensive locker room conversation from yesteryear, and only 11 minutes talking about Hillary's leaked email information. So 198 minutes versus 11 minutes. So the left, again, is skewing yeah. it the same way they're skewing the polls. You know, it's, oh, man, I'm telling you, every time I look on the computer at msn.com and a couple of others, everything is about Trump, and it's all negative. And you really don't see anything about Hillary. No, you don't. And then you have these geniuses that call themselves um, conservative Republicans, like Jeff Flake, who goes and says, I'm not voting for Trump. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Let's bring along Cool Mike. Good afternoon, Cool Mike. Thanks for joining us as we're floundering along. <laughs> <laughs> We're having one of those days, Mikey. You know how they go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I did get to listen to your guest. Too bad she had to exit so quickly. But let me tell you something. The only thing uh, the only thing uh, in this country being bashed more than Donald Trump, having signs stolen more than Donald Trump, is yours truly, Mike Farage. <laughs> <laughs> I have a... Uh, um, 
a radio station, a FM radio station locally, spent about an hour just bashing me. I have a copy of it, Annie. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, find a way to send it to you. Um, hopefully within a okay. decade. My uh, my I'll send it tomorrow. Doesn't work real well, but everything's going well. Um, the thing is with Trump is this is uh, what we've never seen. This is uh, coming from the uh, good portion of Republicans as well as Democrats. And, I mean, the, some of the fat cats from the establishment GOP just think, well, it's better to have Hillary than Trump. And this is how it works. This is really a truly potential changing of the guards, possibly. Um, we don't want to get all excited. but And this is exactly what it's up against. And I'll tell you, we're going to see this. Uh, you're not kidding. Every time you hit refresh, yeah, next thing you know, they're going to claim that Trump was actually, uh, you know, an offspring of Joseph Goebbels. They, some of these stories are beyond outrageous. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> I know. They just come up with all these hoaxes. They put it out there. And, of course, you know, with the Internet today, people don't vet what they're reading. They don't turn around and see if there's another source for this that they can check it against. And, of course, now all these phony stories start circulating as if it's the truth. Such as like this uh, uh, re, uh, newspaper interview. This, uh, the comment that Hillary is blowing up right now, Donald Trump is demeaning to women. And uh, excuse me, she not only dances with some of these rappers, but I mean, she takes their money. And need me remind you some of the language of bitches and hoes and machine guns. And I, I, I mean, what a hypocrite. I mean, she and not, uh, like I said, she not only dances with them at these parties and gets their endorsement, she takes their money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a double standard. And it's said that her locker room talk was far worse than what Donald Trump's is. Not just Bill Clinton. She has such a foul mouth. But no one wants to talk about that. Oh, because yeah. Now, women aren't supposed to behave that way, so you can't talk about that. Oh, heck, you know, I can curse with the best of them, Michael. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Tell me a woman who really well, can't curse with the best of them. She, she um, repeatedly curses the, the very people who protect her, you know, Secret Service. I've heard numerous stories about the way she treats them. Yeah, this was coming, some of those stories she came from... Was Lyndon Bain Johnson. Some of those stories were actually coming from former... Uh, uh, Secret Service members, uh, where yeah. he was, uh, one of the members was supposed to be, um, oh, shoot. Uh, I think they were trying to take Chelsea Clinton to school or something like that, and she was on the phone, and they were trying to get her out so she can get to school on time. And even Chelsea Clinton cursed the Secret Service, calling them pigs and uh, some other horrible things. And her response was, you know, my parents say the same thing. Her parents treated the Secret Service. The president and the first lady treated the Secret pain. Service with disrespect, taught her daughter to do it. So why do you think Chelsea Clinton would not be a carbon copy of her mother as she heads the Clinton Foundation? I uh, Was it your show, Annie, a week or so ago? Somebody had mentioned about uh, forgetting Chelsea's school books. Um, well, apparently, um, somebody from the Secret Service or somebody, a nanny, or somebody forgot Chelsea's school books on some trip. I don't remember, though, but it's something along those lines. And they said Hillary just beat down that person who forgot the books to no end, and they ended up flying back to, uh, to D.C. or wherever those books were to pick them up. Can't imagine <laughs> that. Oh, that is just, that is hysterical. Oh, actually, it's sad. I, I, thought, it was, I thought that was here, but no. I heard that somewhere. No, that, not talk for about, me. Talk about ridiculous. I mean, let me assure you, Hillary Clinton is as ruthless as they come. I mean, this idea that she's, uh, you know, in, in line for the Mother Teresa Award. Oh, boy. But, you know, yeah, this is how it works. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to cut you off from this. She, she's no lady. And, and, you know, I, I often hear women say, like, um, at the debate, um, Trump was circling behind Hillary 
and he should have done that. He was just showing his manliness, and and she's a woman, you know. And well, he was not, trying to intimidate her. Right, they had. And a, I'm like, you know, Curtis. There was a clip she, on Fox News earlier today that they were showing her on Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres' show, and. She said, Hillary Clinton said, yes, he was circling behind me. He was stalking me. And as soon as she said those words, my head and my ears picked up. I said, stalking you, lady? Really? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if you watched her, when he was talking, she would walk right on up to him or stand directly between him and the audience. Now, who was stalking whom? You know, I would see him walk to the time, other side of the stage when she walked. That I heard stalking. But to use that word from her, and I said, wait a minute, I watched the same debate. I saw him when she walked in front of her, him. He would walk to the other side of the stage. Which I, I don't want to be in the same shot with her when she's talking. Because, you know, if my face accidentally gives something away, I don't want people to see it. So he was doing what was logical. I did not see him stalking her. I saw her. Stalking. I saw her walk into his space, but I did not see him walking into hers. One of, one of the things that uh, progressives love: make an issue of nothing, just make it out of thin air, and then all of a sudden uh, play the uh, the person who solves the problem that never existed. I mean, uh, and of course, she goes. This is just like a uh, a gossip column. It goes from Trump staring at her with uh, apparently giving her dirty looks to uh, getting a little too close to her to following her around to now stalking. Uh, I, I mean, by MSNBC's uh, evening news tonight, it's going to be he was beating her down on national TV and uh, a million progressives will swear they witnessed it. Mm -hmm. it just never an end to their bullshit. It's just never, ever, ever an end. Locally mm -hmm. here, Annie. Uh, I'm going to send you uh, send you guys some links. They're talking about enrollment being up in our schools, um, and which is false. But 74 percent of our third graders test and the state testing are illiterate. 100 percent of those kids are blacks and Latinos and just poor white kids. But they're celebrating an enrollment in one of the uh, one of the theme alternative type schools where it went up. I think to myself, this is what this world has become. I mean, these people are in charge of education, and look where it's at. And Grand Rapids is not, uh, we're not like the uh, the lone city. If you go to many inner city schools, you will find the same problems. I mean, it's just, just how it is. Whatever they get their hands on, it just absolutely implodes. Uh, I mean, just never an end. Well, we, right now here in Buford County, we're, we're fighting our school board because they want to in, impose a 1% sales tax and at the same time put up a referendum to raise bonds. Now, these bonds are supposed to pay for the starting of brick-and-mortar projects with the schools. Part of that money is going to be going to hmm, the colleges. Wait, wait, wait. Our school board should be only kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, what are you doing with giving that money to our higher learning? They get their money from the state and federal government. They get their money from tuition, not the taxpayer dollar. You, we're not going to pay twice over for the same building. Please, really? We're fighting them on the bond well, referendum, we're and we're fighting them on the taxes. Now, we had the hurricane come through here. It was a, between a Category 2 and 1 when it finally made landfall. So, yes, some of the schools did get damaged. But the local private academy, which is kindergarten or preschool all the way through 12th grade, has the highest graduation rate and the highest college enrollment rate. They were open on Wednesday. They were had full classes going Wednesday morning. Our school district has yet to open a single classroom. Now, how is um, it? On those bonds, Annie, on those bonds, Annie, follow the money. One of the things I noticed here in Grand Rapids is some of the people pushing for the bonds are the ones purchasing it, and when it comes out in the end, they get they raise the interest rate. They get like triple percent. It's like, this is like, I, I wish I were rich so I could be part of the scam. I mean, this is like, it's like, yeah, sell the bonds, sell the bonds. 
and basically through the over the next say ten or twenty years, uh, basically people who are pushing the initiative uh, for approval, uh, they they get the the interest rates get jacked up. So if it's a bond for say like here in Grand Rapids, I think it was twenty five years, one hundred and seventy five million. It's really going to be twenty five years, uh, three hundred million. I mean, it's it's just a complete scam. Follow the money. Yeah, well, now also go one step further. When you follow the money, go to see who in government gets the contracts for whatever project is going on. I've got a county council member who has an air conditioning company, and I, I'm not in his district, so, you know, legitimately I can't ask him the question when he was running for office, but I can ask the question now since he is on the council. Has he given up any of those county contracts he's held? And if the school bond goes through and the sales tax goes through, all those air conditioning projects that is on that referendum, will he recuse himself for bidding on it? That's another thing. Of course not. Quit it, Annie. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so, you know... There's, there's scams that go on left and right, and we as the voters got to keep a sharp eye on that. So, you know, i got to go before my county GOP on Thursday and present two different ads to fight these sales tax initiatives. Because if they go through, our sales tax will increase 33%. 33% our sales tax. So every single item you go to the store to buy will have increased. We'll have an, a large increase. All right, you may not be paying for it on a loaf of bread, but you are paying for it when you're when you're buying the paper plates, the paper napkins, the garbage bags, the baby's diapers. You're going to be paying for it up the kazoo. Now, what poor household could afford such an increase, a 33% increase in what you were laying out the year before? Uh, there's this guy... Who I've met on Facebook. His name is Howard, and he's part of the uh, California Taxpayers Association. And uh, I commented, I was watching the Chicago Cubs and the uh, San Francisco um, Giants game, and I was watching it on Fox Sports, so it was their local feed. And they have uh, um, they have this really good commercial where the music is very soft and gentle, and we are looking to help obese kids. Blah blah blah. To help sugar diabetes, blah, blah, blah. vote yes, and it, it, what it is basically, it's a b- brilliant commercial, and it's for a um, tax on beverages, on soft drinks and other, uh, you know, other other beverages, um, and it never ends. Actually, there is a uh, business tax being assessed in San Francisco um, because the with the progress of uh, businesses. But the successful companies that are being run, they claim it's creating homelessness. So this is a homelessness tax on the businesses. So I commented to my friend. They said, hey, I saw this commercial. And then he just listed a whole list. I wish I were in their chat room. I posted of tax initiatives just on this ballot alone. And one of them is yes or no for a marijuana tax if the state approves the legalization of marijuana, that night. (laughs) So in other words, if it's approved on November 8th, the sale is, uh, begins, no, uh, or excuse me, November. If it's approved November 8th, and it goes to sale November 9th, the tax is automatically there. They're not even waiting. So you vote yes to immediately tax it. I mean, what, uh, it just never ends. And, And, San Francisco and these other cities are not run by what I would say um, conservative business types. Well, you know, like I said, you know, you got to look to see what is on the ballot. Most people that go to vote do not look at the referendums. They look at whatever is at the top of the ticket. And if it comes all the way down to like door catcher, they don't care. They don't pay attention. This is why. People like you, Mike, people like Curtis, people like me, it's important we tell the public what is going on because the wool is being pulled over our eyes. Now, I brought up to my county GOP that there's three referendums on our ballot, and one of them is a bond issue. And all of a sudden, everyone's going, 
oh, I didn't know that there was a bond issue on there. Look, it was in the newspaper. It was a full page thing that, that I, it was a half page thing they had in the newspaper. I had a copy of it in my hand and I said, here, and it's the middle referendum. It's referendum number two. That's the bond issue. Now, if the sales tax fails and the bond issue goes forward, that means that the school board is now raising, borrowing money on these bonds uh, for projects that has no way to pay it back because the sales tax failed. The sales tax is supposed to pay for those bonds. So now the school board has this debt. And how are they going to pay off that debt? Well, they're going to raise your millage rate. So your property taxes are going to go up. And property taxes include the taxes on your vehicles, your boats, your boat's motors. Your property tax goes will increase on the businesses because they tax the assets in the business. When we owned our business here, Michael, believe it or not, you paid every single year a full sales tax, a property tax, not, not a sales tax, a property tax, on every single thing you owned with the business, whether it was the computer, the desk you sat on, the char- the chair you sat on, the computer program in the computer. They tax it yeah. all at every yeah, that's how single they do year. And the cost of yeah, doing that's, business, that's they do it. the cost of doing you know, business Annie, they would do, just be no, astronomical. No. Annie, if you were to walk outside your door right now, um, walk a couple blocks to the business district and ask, are you aware of this? Sadly, 8 out of 10 would have no idea of it. It'd be They, they would be like, oh, it's the first time hearing of it. I mean, it's really sad. Well, actually, the business I'm, owners I'm here... That. I have to hope it might be strict. A lot of people just uh, go with the uh, straight party. Um, and then click, uh, you know, maybe do a couple others and then just uh, put in their ballot. Because I'll tell you, if all the progressives vote and they go all the way down for school board, I'm doomed. <laughs> I'm destined for last place if that's the uh, if that happens. <laughs> but, you know, what the county is doing, and they say, oh, but we need these buildings. We need this. We need that. All right, fine. I can understand that you've got actual structures that need to be shored up, repaired. You've got actually air conditioning units and HVAC units that do need work or replacement. I can understand that. But when it comes to all these other additional projects they throw in, that's when you lose me. And, you know, when I was doing these ads, Michael, and I'm getting heat from a couple of the members, and we'll find out what happens Thursday, which way it goes. But the uh, chair of the GOP had asked to meet with me to alter one of the ads. And I had an idea of what he was talking about. Because of the failure of the infrastructure here in the county during the hurricane, the only place that was operating was the sheriff's office. Everything else was dead. The infrastructure here completely collapsed. And I had a county council member who evacuated. He was down in Atlanta. He was up on Facebook trying to keep as many constituents you know, aware of what's going on. Just people from outside of the state wanting to know what's going on with family here. And he admitted on his Facebook page that the county emergency infrastructure collapsed. And now we've got the sales tax where they're asking for all these beautiful pork projects. So Jim asked me, can you alter this and I already showed him the copy I had where I stated that the failure of the critical infrastructure as witnessed in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew is why we need to vote no on this sales tax. Any money being raised with the additional sales tax should be for emergency management and critical infrastructure. And I got said, are you going to be, uh, what was the word he was using, exploiting Hurricane Matthew. And, you know, this is where the PC police come in. Hey, listen, we just lived through this. We saw what happened to our county when this hurricane came through. It is a shining example of why we have to rethink what they are asking the voters to vote for and why we should have the county go back and rethink exactly what they should be raising money for to repair. I, I don't. I don't think what, I'm exploiting. What's the thing about not letting a tragedy go to waste or something like that, Annie? 
but am I doing that? Or am I just saying this is a perfect example of why we need our county to put the right priorities out there? Well, and there, there's no reason for that. I mean, having having it collapse and shut down like that, I, I mean, they should, where you live, that should be well prepared for whatever. But never an end, you know, just never, ever an end. God, this is it. Of course, you can't let a good uh, tragedy go to waste. That's a good time to uh, uh, get the taxpayers to uh, fund more money. Well, and in this case... In this case, I'm using Hurricane Matthew to show why we should not be going for this sales tax and why we need the county council to go back to the drawing board and do it the right way. Well, am I right or wrong? Well, I'm obviously on your side. I I, I think overlooked in the the fact that cities and municipalities and states and... um, Federal governments are such a big waste of money. Overlooked at how poor many counties are run. Um, and the fact that of all the counties in the United States, there's only like 50 of them that have a AAA bond rating. Um, I mean, it's, <laughs> county governments, again, are, are, are another, just another bureaucracy of, I, I don't know what word I'm looking for. But, uh, you know, hopefully you'll have success, Annie. Hopefully people will see what you're talking about. Yeah, I, listening. Well, I think I'm going to have to go and do a newspaper editorial, too, just to uh, to push my point forward uh, and see what type of feedback I get on that one, too. Because it is obvious that, you know, the county is doing this, as my friend Mike Cutler says, bass backwards. You know, they should be saying, this is these are the critical projects we need to have done. This is the cost analysis for these projects. These are contractor bids for these projects. So we know that this is going to cost us X, Y, Z. So we need need to know that we have to shore up our phone system. We have to shore up our emergency response team. We have to do these building repairs. These are the critical things that we're asking the taxpayer to allow us to go forward and put these projects on a referendum. What they did instead was, hey, let's see if we can raise $217 million and we're going to turn around to the public and everyone else and say, tell us what you would like us to pay for when we raise these taxes. They come up with this arbitrary figure out of thin air, say we're going to increase the sales tax 1% on this issue, on these issues. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what issues? You're telling us you're going to raise $217 million in additional sales tax. And then you're saying to the public, these are going to be for projects. What projects? We're going to have the public tell us what projects they're going to be for. Really? Isn't that backwards? It certainly is backwards. The the government should provide vital services. Other than that, just not be involved. Absolutely. And... Our county council members who vote on the budget every single year were completely unaware that they give $2 million each to the University of South Carolina campus as well as to the Technical College of the Low Country. County taxpayers already in their state and federal taxes pay for these two higher learning institutions. What the heck is county council doing sending them additional taxpayer money? Why? First Why? rule in government spending, why build one when you can build two for twice the price? Yeah, they're triple dipping into the taxpayer's pocket. And the taxpayers were completely unaware of it. And the county council members who voted for the budget were completely unaware it sat in the budget. And it has been there every year for as long as I have lived in this county. And no one wants to admit it. And yet, the schools, the colleges are saying... Well, we don't have money to do these repairs. Well, then obviously you've got some of the world's worst lobbyists up there in Columbia not being there saying, hey, listen, these are critical things we need for our colleges to keep them running. Please give us the state and federal funding to make these repairs. But no, they go to the taxpayers. And guess what? They throw into that, Michael, the additional thing of saying, oh, we want to expand the arts center over here. And we want to have these better sports arenas over here. 
<laughs> wait, wait, wait. I thought you needed the money for critical repairs, not for art centers and sports arenas on these campuses. Again, go to the federal and state governments for that additional money, not the county taxpayers. And we've got our guest in. So we've, we're, we're batting one out of three so far, Curtis. <laughs> so <laughs> let's welcome aboard yep. former Florida Lieutenant Governor and best-selling author Jennifer Carroll. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can hear that I'm rallying against my local government over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. You know, a lot of people don't understand. The school districts, particularly if the school districts are impacted, impacted meaning that they have students attending, that they, where their parents work on federal installations like the military base or the Federal Reserve or something like that, that the school districts get a windfall of money from the federal government that is rarely ever seen by the, the taxpayers in the local areas. So some districts may get $2 million, $4 million, $8 million, depending on the number of students from the federal government, just because those students attend school and their parents work on a federal installation. So not only do the school districts get the budget from Tallahassee, the state government, and they do get some for, particular, for some um, uh, special programs from the federal government, but they also get this windfall of extra money that nobody ever lets them know. And, it, and so it, they make it seem as the only budget monies that they get is from the state. And yet still, they cannot handle their budget properly. Well, it's funny because we're battling uh, three referendums. A countywide additional sales tax 1% for capital improvement pro- projects. A 1% school district increase in the sales tax for supposedly brick-and-mortar projects, and then a bond referendum to pay for those projects. So they're going to borrow money. That's huge. That borrow money mm-hmm. from, the, from the taxpayers uh, to borrow these bonds to do these projects. So they're going to go into additional debt to the school district, and then they're going to ask the taxpayers to pay for that additional debt with the sales tax. And we're going after them. Our county GOP is going after them tooth and nail about that. Matter of fact, we've got several other GOP countywide groups that are joining us in a half-page ad running on the 23rd Sunday in the Sunday paper to get a prominent (laughs) voter information out there. Well, well, this is what the citizens need to rise up because when you put, no matter if it's a half cent or a whole cent tax, it never seems to go away. They'll tell you it only lasts for 20, 30 years. But within 15 to 20 years, they're coming back for an extension because they haven't learned how to operate under the old budget. They get accustomed to the new money, and then they tell the taxpayers, oh, we need to continue with this money because we need to do additional things, which they should have been doing those additional things with the half-cent or cent sales tax they said they wanted to do to begin with. But also, too, that the, the state government likes local districts to levy the taxes, the homeowners pay tax, part of the homeowner's tax goes to the school district. So if the state, there's a, a pot of money that um, is supposed to go to the school district for fixing up infrastructure, main, maintenance, and even building schools that is shared across the state. But the state normally gives the school districts that have levied the maximum amount of taxes that they can levy to show good faith that they've made their taxpayers in the local areas pay the maximum amount of taxes that they can and even ask them to increase their taxes to collect more from local level ex- um, efforts to make sure that those people, that those school districts can get the state taxes, um, state dollars for their, uh, for their infrastructure improvements. Yeah, what I also love is that as the school budget expands, you know, the school is allowed to take... It, Eight uh, percent, what they can borrow is eight percent of the budget. When once they reach that cap, all they have to do is increase their budget, and now they can borrow more money because now eight percent is that many more dollars of their budget. So it becomes a mm-hmm. vicious cycle. Correct. Vicious, vicious cycle. Yes. And the worst part is, is that our school districts can actually put borrow b- these bonds for projects without taxpayer notification. They don't have to tell yep. you that they are going to be borrowing these bonds. But yet these th- Correct. these guys are sly as a fox because they put it up as a bond <laughs> referendum. 
a referendum on the ballot November 8th. So now it's like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you're not going to let us borrow these bonds uh, because you really don't like us to help the kids. You, you hear that argument? Really? No, because you're killing the well, taxpayers. I tell you, it's, it's the old Democrat argument of the children, the seniors, and fear and scare tactics. But what a lot of these local governments need to do, including the school board, is to manage their budget that they have. And the easy way to not manage properly and not be have full accountability is to look towards the taxpayers and charge them with more fees and taxes so that they can get extra money to continue their bad behavior. Exactly. And if these two referendums, these two taxes and the bond referendum, our local sales tax will increase 33%. That is unbelievable. And if if the bond referendum passes and neither the taxes pass, that means that our millage rates will increase. So they'll get us one way or the other. Either way. Correct. Absolutely correct. And the shameful part is, is when my husband and I moved here to South Carolina, our countywide sales tax was only 4%. In 16 years, we have seen it go up to 8% once, down to 7%. It's now back down to 6%. And now they want to bring it back up to 8%. Uh, doubled. It is Again, it's all, in, all in, in not managing properly. It's easy to spend other people's money. So if anybody were to, to take out a dollar from their own wallet to pay for these expenses, they will think twice about their expenditures and what they're spending the money on and how much they're spending it on and for how long. Uh, oftentimes, there are a lot of contracts within the local districts within the state government that are executed and the contracts continue without ever revisiting them to see if they can get a better deal to a different contractor. So that in itself costs taxpayers a lot of money for expenditures that either they do not have to incur or that the expenditure is not reasonable for this certain time because prices may go up or down or services may go up or down, but without rebidding some of these contracts or calling to test the current contracts that the, the areas may have, they, they may continue to pay higher costs for the level of services and products that they're, that they're um, buying. Yeah, and it, I try to explain this to people, especially, you know, through my Tea Party group, and I write editorials to the newspaper, but people don't understand that when they pay the millage rate, here you pay the millage rate not only on your real property, but on your vehicles, on your boats, and if you've got a, mm-hmm. a boat mm-hmm. motor, you're paying a ta- that also. Mm-hmm. All these school t- mm-hmm. uh, taxes are in there as well as the county taxes, and every mm-hmm. single business has to every year pay a property tax on their assets. And mm-hmm. my husband had yeah. a home inspection business, and he operated out of a small laptop, a flashlight, a pad of paper and a pen is basically his tools. You know, no, we didn't declare a home office or anything like that. And for five years, I had to pay property tax on a $200 laptop. Can you believe that? Mm-hmm. And people don't understand. That can. That's how, how government works. Goods and services will increase with these stupid yes. taxes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's absolutely it's burdensome. And we've got a question from someone in the chat room, Vito Esposito, who has his own show uh, on Radio Jihad. He's asking uh, your opinion of Corinne Brown, who is finally being unseated in this last primary, because you did run against her a few Uh, years ago. I did. I'm taking my finger and I'm swiping it across the brow of my forehead. (laughs) 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 You know, it's... She has been plagued throughout the years and have gotten away with lots of unethical uh, conduct. And finally, with with the situation that she has now in the courts of another uh, unethical conduct, it was the right decision by the voters to not uh, have to go through a special election had she won her primary election and come through with a general election that it will be an additional cost to the taxpayers to have a special election hatch if she went through her trial and was found guilty. Uh, we had that with a local 
individual, a state house member mm-hmm. that went through his primary. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was facing some charges and just pled guilty. So now that election is not, not going to go through a special election because we still have the general to go through. But it does end up being a cost to the supervisors of elections to get somebody else's name on the ballot or have to go out with instructions to the voters that if you vote for this person, it means you're voting for the stand-in. But it's, it's high time that we have cleanup in government and have ethical people that are doing the right work for the people. So this was a good change for the Jacksonville, the Northeast Florida area. Uh, and it turns out Vito said he worked on your campaign for Congress first corrupt Corinne. So that's probably, you got a friend there in the <laughs> chat room. So thank you, Vito. I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate his help and support. But we have a large election coming up here on November 8th, and people are receiving their absentee ballots. I encourage individuals to not forget about that. Oftentimes people request it, and then life gets the best of them, or the absentee ballot ends up in a bulk, in a bulk mail of, of just trash that's coming in, advertisements and so forth, and they forget to return it. It has to be received to the supervisor of elections by 7 p.m. on Election Day itself. The better thing to do is to fill it out. I like to to my my kids vote absentee, so I like to hand carry those ballots to the supervisor's office, and and my supervisor of election knows me, so I'm saying, this is authenticated. I am delivering it on behalf of my children. I want to see you process it in. Sometimes, in some people's uh, supervisors of elections, if your signature does not match up pretty close to what they have on file, it is put aside, and if there's an issue with the election or you query whether your absentee ballot was counted or so, they will have to research and see if yours was one put aside. And there are many absentee ballots that is put aside and never counted because the signature doesn't match up their original signature on their registration forms. As we know, as time goes by, our signatures change. For many people, our signatures change. We get a little lazy. We kind of scribble something. And if we have supervisors of elections office that we do have some, some, some advocates for the other side, regardless if you're Republican or Democrat, there are people that work in the office that may want to put something aside so that that ballot typically wouldn't go towards their candidate or against their candidate. And those things happen, as we've seen a lot of reports of voter fraud. And this election cycle is not going to be anything different for attempts of voter fraud. So I encourage everyone that is sending in their absentee ballot to communicate with their supervisor of elections. The number one, see if they received it, if it was processed, so they know for sure it was you that returned your own ballot. They did did have, and and in my congressional race, and Vito mentioned that uh, earlier on, that uh, my, my congressional race against Corinne Brown, part of the district at that time, went into the Orlando area. And it was a heavily Democrat area. And we found, I had some Democrats working, volunteering on my campaign as we were chasing the absentee ballots to remind people to return their ballots and seeing the names on the list who requested ballots. We found some of those same people helping us to call folks to remind them to turn in their ballots that there were dead people on that list. And some of the people knew these folks in the community that had died since uh, earlier the year before. We turned that information over to the supervisor of elections, and he was a, not my party, so nothing was done. It, it was it led to stand, and that's unfortunate. It, it really undermines our election and voting process, and that's why some people feel it really doesn't matter what my, that my vote doesn't count, but Hitler was elected by one vote. So your vote does count. We've had members like Ellen Bogdanoff in the state of Florida, state house representative. She won by two votes. So every single person's vote does count, but please follow up, particularly your absentee ballot, follow up to make sure it was received, and if they have any questions about it, at least you're right there on the phone to answer any indiscrepancies that may have existed with your ballot. You see, I I never thought about that. Imagine that. Oh, that... That voice you just heard was a former co-host of mine, Cool Mike, that uh, we've invited in. Um, but I never thought about, you know, contacting them to verify that your absentee ballot was vote was counted. Because as I understood, it, they're mm-hmm. only counted in close races. Uh, and as you said... No, that used to be in the past. No, that used to be in the past where they'll just put them aside and not even count them. Now they're counting them early on. 
so before the the count on on from the, the votes that come in on election day, they start that day, election day, opening up those ballots and processing them. Well, what I also find interesting, especially up in Ohio, because this was on the news yesterday, that there are more Republicans in Ohio doing absentee voting compared to Democrats. So if that is going to be well, the true, trend... Well, that's typically the case. That's the, No, that's not the trend. How things work out, is, and we have it in Florida, too, that absentee ballots are requested more so, or returned more so by Republicans. So you see like a 30% difference. Of, of increase of Republicans over Dems. But the Democrats tend to turn out a lot more during early voting. So in the state of Florida, we have seven days prior to the election, early voting, and you see a trend of more Democrats coming out to early vote than Republicans. And then on election day, depending on what the weather condition is, you may see a higher, particularly that weekend prior to election, when they, in, in Florida, there's a, um, a poll, a soul to the poll drive that the Democrats do, and they shuffle people to the polls after church or ask, encourage people to hurry up and get to their poll increasing right after church. And that tends to uh, uh, really push more Democrats to turn out on the election day, again, depending on the weather. If it's raining or if it's snowing, you tend to have, according to statistics, lower Democrats, lower Democrat turnout on those particular weather day that it falls on the election than you have Republicans. Oh, that's how California and New York has a major snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope that the voters do their homework and, and really study these candidates and look at their own situation and say, what's best for me and my family and what's best for this country, and let me do the right thing, regardless if they're Republican or Democrat, to say in a general election, you can vote for who you want, whether it's the Green Party and no party, you could write in somebody, you can vote for Republicans. You can vote for a Democrat. You don't have to be a Republican uh, to vote for Green Party, per, uh, be a Green Party person to vote for only a Green Party person. You can vote for whoever you want in a general election. So that's number one, what people need to understand. Number two, I don't want anybody to suppress their vote whatsoever. I don't want you know any conditions and pray for any conditions to occur to stop anyone from coming to the polls. What I want people to do is to be honest. We have two individuals that are of the major party of Donald Trump and um, Hillary Clinton, that will be one of those, will be the presidential, uh, would be the president nominated, uh, elected after the November election. Now, do we want somebody that has demonstrated for over 30 years that they are untrustworthy, that they have put the, them, their own selves and, their, and the finance of their family paramount to the taxpayers, that have covered up along the way of any questions asked of, of ethical uh, behavior that either they don't remember ha don't remember doing it or have plead the fifth and we have a, a, a commander in chief position where we need to have a person that's ethical a person that's honest a person that have not have a history of the dishonesty and the compromising of national security and circumventing the law and living above the law where all other citizens in this country have to abide by those laws. Otherwise, we will be in jail for the rest of our lives. We may not ever see sunlight. Or we have a candidate that have never had these sort of ethical situations where it will compromise the service in office and a person with a background that have a history of creating jobs, of having a better economic uh, uh, picture and, and, and experience experience that can turn around the economy in this country and stating that he is for the American people. We haven't had a candidate in many, many years to say that they're for the American people and want to restore our representative republic and repeatedly say that time and time again, from our military to our seniors to our millennials to our hardworking taxpayers in this country of a person that wants to represent all of us, regardless of race, Creed, color, or party affiliation, as opposed to a Hillary Clinton, who says one thing in private, another thing in public, will tell the FBI that she doesn't remember and get away with it. None of us complete ignorance uh, against the, you know, for defense and the law. We'll be in prison. Yes, so she gets away with it. And, and all the other so-called dealings behind closed doors, the pay-to-play, the Clinton Foundation with monies collected from foreign entities where they get favors through our, our federal government, 
And so we cannot turn a blind eye to that and say things will change if she ends up being president. It will be worse. If we think that we didn't know about the Clinton uh, situation with Benghazi, with with the foundation, with the the FBI and the emails and the destruction of government property without proper authorization and the mishandling of classified information that may have fell into the hands of our enemies, then you didn't know about that until this election came about. You think you're going to know anything when they're in office to have control of the Department of Justice, to have control of the FBI, to have control of the executive office, and our Congress is basically spineless to do anything with what's going on now under President Obama, they'll be even neutered under a President Hillary Clinton. The American people should want better for themselves to understand what our founding fathers have put in place with our Constitution. And every one of these members that have been elected rose their, raised their right hand to say that they will protect and defend the Constitution and abide by it, but they, are, they have not done so in accordance to their oath that they took, and therefore they're in violation of their oath and should not be elected to any given office in this country. So the American people need to do their homework, figure out what's in their best interest for themselves and their family, and put the person in office that they, they may think is a lesser of two evil, but I tell you what, if the lesser of the evil gives you the, the, the satisfaction that you need for a better job, for a better safe safe zone for where you live, for a better safety of our borders, for increased opportunity, for prosperity, for you to achieve the American dream that you want to achieve, for better education, then therefore, then go with the lesser evil if that's how your concept of thinking is. Wow. <laughs> I was waiting for you to come up for a breath. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's why I love you so much. I didn't mean to give you a mouthful like that, but I'm very passionate. I'm an immigrant to this country. My parents came here for the opportunities in America, and it wasn't easy for us. My parents at most times held two jobs, both of them. So that's four jobs in a household. But they were, number one, not going to rely on government of monies, which is a taxpayer money. They came for the opportunities, and they saw that the door was open for them to achieve whatever they wanted. They instilled in me hard work and appreciation, appreciating this land. We assimilated here. We legally migrated. We appreciated the laws of this land. I joined the military as an enlisted E-1, the lowest of the bottom totem pole that you can get to in the military. I was able to spend 20 years in the military, retire as a Navy lieutenant commander. I appreciate what this country has done for myself and my family, and I gave back by my service to my to, to this country. And I hope that individuals that are receiving the benefits of the liberties and freedoms do not take that for granted and assume it's always going to be here. Because depending on who we put in office, those freedoms and liberties can be eroded. Depending on who we put in the Supreme Court, those the, the founding fathers of how they crafted a document for you know about 230 years old that um, that that they have that this country has been in existence that we have been able to stand the test of time with a, a republic representative for the people by the people and we have not toppled over like many other countries that we're seeing in the Middle East or so, that we have an appreciation here that we should cherish and not want it to turn into some banana republic where the, the only the elites get their way, only the elites get away from having um, going through the judicial system, only the elites get to make the money and, and circumvent the laws of, of paying um, the, their proper dues, and then everyone else underneath has to suffer and pay more taxes like your school board district there, or our middle class, every time they turn around, they have to give more money to maybe, you know, to help with refugees that come in, and the refugees haven't even paid into a tax system or a social security system, and they're having a reaping benefit. And Hillary Clinton says she wants 50,000 more refugees to come in. And those refugees, we, we cannot properly vet half of them. We are giving them money that they haven't worked to, to acquire, and the taxpayers that are working to pay into the system of the tax system, they cannot even get a tax break. And that, that, I, I can't even fathom an America like that. We should be taking care of Americans first, like Donald Trump is saying, and everyone else as we have the resources with the proper vetting that we're able to do so. We're not heartless. Our country is not heartless at all. When you look at the, the issue that happened in Haiti with the, with the hurricane, 
we turned out clothing and food and medicine and in drones more so than any other country. We have a compassion, but we have to take care of our boundaries first, our America, the great first, and our people, the greatest first. And then we can turn to help other people. Exactly, exactly. But we've got a friend of yours that's going to be joining in the conversation, so let's bring aboard my friend, George Farrell. Good afternoon, George. George, you Hello, us. everyone. How is everyone doing? Ah, we've hey, got, fantastic. We've got Jennifer Carroll with us, and you know she's she's just rocking the show, absolutely rocking the show. You know, Jennifer, you and I have discussed I this before that you know I almost went into the Navy at one point, so I can understand where you're coming from. Instead, I swore my oath when I went and I joined NYPD, so I take that oath to heart. But George, we see our elected officials completely ignoring it. No, you're not ignoring me. Um, the lieutenant governor makes great, excellent points. Uh, she knows she has the experience. She actually has the pr- experience to be president, and uh, we just love her to death. <laughs> so uh, she's just a wonderful person. She Actually, she should be uh, secretary of the Navy at, at the minimum. <laughs> so, <laughs> looking for great things in the future. <laughs> Well, oh. we, we have we have to start with the first step, like Stephen Covey says, start, start with the first thing in mind. And the first thing in mind that we have to do now is to make sure we elect a person that's going to respect our laws, that's going to respect our Constitution, that's going to respect our people in this country, and put this country first and foremost. You know, when Arnold Schwarzenegger won the uh, governor's position in, in California, Everybody was, oh, we ought to change the Constitution because he's a foreign-born uh, person, and therefore we need to um, we, we need to change the Constitution to allow foreign-born people to serve. As a foreign-born person, I can tell you firsthand, I agree with our founding father that it should be a natural-born citizen because you can't serve two masters. If you're born somewhere else and have an affinity for that other place, if you happen to have to have sanctions or to take military action against them, you will think twice about doing so. You would, you would circumvent your own country, which you're leading, to do so. And it's just human nature. It's just, you know, just how, we, how, we, how, we are, how we're built and how we program. So, therefore, you know, it, it, I, it's interesting that people question Donald Trump or say that he's a racist because, I shouldn't say people, but the Democrats, they put this out there because every election, four-year presidential election, we get the same old playbook. The one on that you're racist and the second one that you're, that you're anti-women. And they paint that anti-women however they can. So whatever fits the narrative is what they're going to throw out there and see what sticks against the wall. And unfortunately, as people, as, as human beings, our emotions take over and then we respond and react with our emotions without looking at logic and facts. So, for example, with Obama, if painted, oh, he's a racist because he questioned where President Obama was born. Since when have the word and the term of racist been so watered down that we don't even recognize it anymore? So when real, when real racism occurs to an individual, they don't really have standing because it's been so watered down. People poo-poo it and say, you don't really have an issue of racism. They question the p- birthplace of Ted Cruz. They question the birthplace of John McCain. Why wasn't it called racist then? Only because President Obama is a black person. And when Hillary Clinton started this during her campaign against him in 2008, as to call out where he was born or where he said he was raised, and has pictures or images of him in his African garb, and now she wants to play hands off, like, oh, it's, 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 um, it's Donald Trump who started this. But people should stand back and question: Is that really racism? I have experienced real racism, and to question where somebody is born does not fall in the definition of racism. Then it goes to the the women thing. All of a sudden, thirty years later, women come out of the woodwork to fit a narrative of some comments that Donald Trump made 30 years or 20 years ago. And people don't question, well, how how valid is this? Where is your evidence? They just run with it, particularly the liberal press, to, 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 again, go to the emotions of people, particularly women, because they know both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton is lacking with the support of women, particularly, and they claim, suburban, educated white women. 
So, why, again, the narrative there is like only suburban white women could be educated. Educated white women live all over the place. It's not just suburban anywhere. So they want to paint a narrative that Donald Trump has this issue with women, and these women are not going to vote for him. But the women, some of them, are not going to vote for Hillary Clinton either. So why are we allowing these, the, the liberal press and the people who put through these uh, lots of evidential, evidentiary information out and go on our emotion to say, oh, I'm not going to vote for him because uh, he pulled some vile things out of his mouth. And then these women are saying this, but yet still the accusers and the, the who, who says that they were raped or groped and was also paid payoff money from uh, Bill Clinton's situation, those people are not even interviewed. Those people are not given any credibility to their story for all of these years. So all through from the time Bill Clinton was Arkansas governor to when he was president, these women made the accusations throughout all of these years. For Donald Trump, we never heard of all the beautiful women that he's been surrounded with, with the pageants and everything else, even from a young person to being an elder man. Nobody ever accused him and charged him with these things. Now, 20-some-odd days prior to the election, it comes out. The difference of people making an accusation, like Bill Cosby, is that these accusers throughout the years made something be known that this person did this to them, whether people listened or whether they had their facts together to present, to bring up charges, is one thing, but at least throughout the years it was known. For these four or five women that have recently come out, this is the first time we're hearing about this. So people hearing this should be questioning what is the motive, where is the evidence, why wasn't it presented earlier, not to discount what they're saying, but to then bring context to the information that's being presented to make sure you're not going off of emotion to respond to how the Democrats want you to respond. You know, you're saying exactly right. I could not say anything better. You know, as I said earlier, Hillary Clinton is an accessory after the fact of every single crime Bill Clinton committed because she is the one who intimidated, threatened, there's one witness that had his house broken into. He was beaten to the point where he was hospitalized. You know, there's story after story after story of Hillary Clinton and her operatives, you know, silencing the witnesses and victims. And the only person really that's doing the interviews with these women happens to be Sean Hannity. And God bless him for getting mm-hmm. it out there. But, I mean, yeah. I watched the original interview of Juanita Broderick. And I don't know how anyone could watch that without crying with her. I mean, it is horrific. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's she's getting stronger as she's getting the story out there, and she's finally got the courage to speak out. But this is how dangerous Hillary Clinton is. So, you know, she's intimidated herself all the way up into the seat of power where she's looking to grab. And again, James mm-hmm. Comey is not prosecutor because he's her buddy. He didn't prosecute her in white well, water. No. He didn't prosecute them with mm-hmm. uh, with the uh, Mark Rich pardon, and he's definitely not going to prosecute her with these emails in the server. It's just not going to happen. And if she gets in office, we'll never know the truth. When I was in the military, and the military purchased or the government purchased any material for you, whether it was your your uniform, your shoes that was uh, military issued, or computer or phone, you could not destroy that item without the military's consent. So there were cell phones purchased for Hillary Clinton that was purposely destroyed, whether she gave the authorization, and I don't see a low-level staffer destroying something like that without getting a direction from somebody, somebody higher than them to do so. So these things are destroyed, and nobody questions that it's a federal offense to destroy government property. Then she was questioned by the FBI as to who gave permission for the destruction. She says she doesn't remember. So if you say you don't remember, therefore you knew at some point who gave the authorization. So 25 questions asked, 21 times she said she doesn't remember, but yet still on the, on the debate stage, she says she knows very well how <laughs> to handle uh, secret, uh, uh, secret um, classified information, but yet still you don't remember that you were well, that you were um, briefed on how to handle the classified information. You don't remember on deleting the classified information, but yet still on the debate stage, you say you know very well how to handle it, 
and you respect and, and regard the process of handling it, and the American public doesn't question the veracity of what this woman is saying, and if it's, again, anyone in a lower level capacity and, it ha- and people are sitting in jail right now for less, doing less, either accidentally having classified information in their briefcase on their phone or in their uh, taken home. These people are sitting in jail and have lost their, their clearances to ever have any security clearance given to them again. And their lives have been ruined. As a matter of fact, recently a NASA worker had some, some classified information that was at his house. And he was, he, he, the, the Department of Justice moved to have this case go to trial. And he tried to use the defense that Hillary Clinton used, but that was not accepted. So where is the rule of law when we have hot people at the executive level of government getting away with breaking the law and everyone else below them have to uh, have the, the, the penalties applied to them for breaking the law? That is just wrong for any person in this country to accept this behavior as normal. And this is the very sort of thing that you're going to get if a Hillary Clinton is elected. We've seen under President Obama, anyone that challenges their administration, they utilize the IRS to come after them and do all these audits and intimidate them. We've seen with the EPA, for them going into territories and, and, and putting more regulations and restrictions and taxes and levies against hardworking people for no reason. If you challenge this government that currently exists, and Hillary Clinton says, She's going to continue the four more years of President Obama, and we have to take her at her word if she says it, then we know what we have now. Do we want to continue what we have now and have that even get worse? Look at Obamacare. That was shoved down the throats of the American people. They went to Washington, D.C. to talk to their so-called representative government to say this is not what we want. We want open markets. We want lower costs. We want to be able to select our own insurance coverage that fits our personal need and not have to have excess amount charged to us for coverage we don't need just to pay for someone else. And it was poo-pooed on its face, and they still voted in. We have so many insurance companies that are not providing insurance under the Obamacare and not giving people uh, health care under the exchange across the board because they're not making the sort of money that the insurance companies aren't the sort of money that they thought that they were going to make was forcing everybody to go into buying, having to buy, governed by the, 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 the federal government, saying that you have to buy a product, which is health insurance. And now we have people with their deductibles and their cost of insurance that have gone through the roof that if they were to purchase the insurance, because they have to if they have the catastrophic um, illnesses in their family and or they choose not to and go and take the, and have the penalty administered to them at the end of the year, and they have to choose between feeding their families, paying their bills, or paying a high cost for health insurance. And much of the health insurance is, is coverage that they don't need. For example, a single person, like my son, a single boy, why is he paying for birth control? He's never going to use that. It's not something that he's going to, he's going to have the privilege of using because he's a guy. So why should he have to pay for somebody else's birth control? You should be able to tailor your insurance based on how healthy you are, your particular needs, and have it across the board where you can buy insurance across state lines, like we do car insurance and many other things, even, even pet insurance, we could buy across state lines. Why can't we have the opportunity to have government out of our here, put it on a free market, the cost will be reduced when you have competition across state lines, and people can shop for the type of insurance they want. That is a free and open market that we should expect for buying a product that we want. And if you don't want the product, you shouldn't have to be forced to buy it. It's not part of the Constitution, and it's not part of necessity for some people. Exactly. And you hit every single point because I'm one of those that uh, I ended up with Medicare Part D from a prescriptions. When they first came out with it, it seemed like such a great idea, a great plan. But then all of a sudden now the insurance companies are finding they're losing money. So that donut hole, once mm-hmm. you hit it, it is not a donut hole. It is the Grand Canyon. 
to the point where I turned around mm-hmm. and I called my doctor and he says, I can't afford my heart medicine. It's going to cost me $600. I got a choice. I put food in the house or I have my heart medicine. Thankfully, he was able to do mm-hmm. alternatives for me and everything. But I have to get out of this insurance plan because everyday people like us are going to get hurt. And they're saying, I think in 2017, there's going to be another 17 million uninsured Americans because of Obamacare, forcing everyone into Medicaid. Well, uh, it's, it's outrageous. Well, Bill, Clinton, during, Bill Clinton, during a moment of truth a couple of weeks ago, said it's a crazy system. He said, we, we, we insured X amount of people. However, we have 2x amount of people that's uninsured because they can't afford it. It's a crazy system. In a moment of truth, he you know, finally comes out and says what we all know is the fact. And, and so, therefore, it is crippling small businesses as well. And it has gone to the point where it has made a lot of people make less money. Because when people find the threshold of a full-time worker has gone from 40 hours to 30 hours, that has reduced take-home income by 10 hours. So if I used to work 40 hours and, and make, you know, set money that I was comfortable with with my family, and now I've been reduced to 30 hours, that's less money, take home money that I have. Exactly. Exactly. And it's funny, my, my godson said to me, you know, as soon as Obamacare hit, his boss cut his hours. He says, I'm sorry, Obamacare has gone into effect, and I've got to cut your hours down to 30 hours a week. I can't afford to have mm-hmm. you work full time. Even though you are my best worker, I've got to cut you and everyone else mm-hmm. down. So now this kid, he's mm-hmm. just starting out in the world as a young adult and he's got to work two jobs. Now imagine if he ends up getting married, what is he going to do there? He can't afford to. Mm-hmm. And this exactly. is what they have and, done and, to everyone. Mm-hmm. And folks just need to understand, don't, don't look at, at this election as myopic and just looking at through a little pinhole you have to look at it at, at a macro level and look at the big picture. We have border security, that's an issue. We have the education system, that's an issue. We have the job market, that's an issue. We have these folks on Wall Street, that's an issue. We have ISIS, that's an issue. We have trade, that's an issue. And it seems as every day we're, we're, uh, we're breaking up fires, but the, they're not attacking it the right way. They just kind of trying to put a curtain over it, but the fire still exists. So we, our military, our veterans, our small businesses, and everybody is hurting, and, and people just holding their heads just ready to ball and say, you know, God, you know, help me here. And we have an opportunity to change the status quo. We, we cannot afford another four years of, pre, uh, of, of President Obama's administration type of tactics that Hillary Clinton has, has uh, approved of and have wrapped herself around saying that she's going to continue it. We have to look at making a hard change of 180 degree out and look to course correct where this country is going and reason why we need to make this course correction is for the sovereignty of this country. For myself, I'm 57, 57 years old. I'm almost out of here. My life is more in the twilight to the end than it is to the beginning. My children and my grandchildren are the ones that's going to have to put up with the things that we do today. And we may not, people may not look in the future and figure that they need to, to do something better now for future generations, but people before us look to the future to do something so that future generations can be better. We should not be that selfish in thinking that as long as I get mine today, I don't care what happens in the future. We need to look at how we can course correct to improve today, but make it even greater and better for tomorrow. So I ask people that are listening to this call to take this election very seriously. Don't look at just uh, what, what you hear in the 30-second soundbite. Do your own research. Do your own homework. Look at things factually and with a critical thinking and not just following emotions, because oftentimes when we go off emotions, we make the wrong decisions. And we have to look at what's in the best interest of this country and its people and the sovereignty for it and for our future and look to make those hard decisions 
that may be a little bit tough for some people to stomach, whether it's Republicans that don't like the harsh things that's coming out of Donald Trump's mouth, or the Democrats that are looking like, you know, i got to vote for Hillary because she's a Democrat. You don't have to do anything but stay your color and die. And so, therefore, what, you, what you, we would like you to do is to process it all and see of the two major candidates that we have, because Jill Stein is not going to be president. Mr. Johnson is not going to be president. They're going to stick with their 8 or 2 percent that each one of them collectively, collectively have, and they're not going to go over the top to be president. So why put your vote in those categories just as a protest vote? Look to be that difference you want to see. Look to make that difference you want to see by voting for the better of the two candidates that we have running as president in the major party, Democrat and Republican. Look at these candidates from their history to what their policies they're putting out that they want to do and change for the American public and make the better decision as to what's going to propel our country to be prosperous for its people and for this nation. So I thank you guys so much for having me on today, and I hope that on November 8th, we can look at a brighter future for America. And I encourage people to really factor and consider voting for Donald Trump as your next president. Well, Jennifer, thank you for joining us. And people can get you on your website, which is your name, jennifercarroll.com. There's a link up on the show page that they can click on so they can go directly to you and see what you're up to. You know, God bless you for all the hard work you're doing. And thank you for the service you've done for this country, not only in the military, but also in government. And you still do tremendous good work. And you are not old. 57 is not old. Because if it (laughs) is, then I'm ancient. (laughs) We're young, we're beautiful, and we're still here. It was an honor and a privilege. (laughs) It was an honor and a privilege to serve both in the military and in government. And I take, I took, and I still do, my duties and responsibility as a public servant very, very seriously because I wholeheartedly believe that we have gone from having statesmen in office to having politicians, and we need to get back to where our citizens demand having statesmen in office again, because it's really about the people, and the office seats are for, uh, belong to the people, and the people should feel that they are empowered and should have the trigger to get anyone elected and also to get them unelected. So may God bless you, and I thank you for having me on the show. Oh, thank you so much. And you are definitely welcome back. We will be talking to you to get you back on the show soon. I mean, I, unfortunately, George couldn't Thanks. stay with us. Otherwise, we would have had him. But Jennifer, thank you so much, and God bless. All right. God bless. Bye-bye. Check out her website, care, Jennifer. jennifercarroll.com. Wow. I You get her fired up. I, I love this woman, the passion she has. and she. This is what you have to feel in order to help bring our nation back to where it belongs. Passion like hers, passion like yours, Mike, because you're out there running for office in Grand Rapids to try to take your school district back. You know, passion like I have, you know, you've got to have that passion in order to help us turn this nation around and take that passion to the voting booth. Man, there's so much to say, <laughs> so much more to talk about. But we're one getting the, to one a- of the things I thought. Uh, one of the things I thought that was interesting uh, early, uh, early in her interview um, today, is talking about all these. Okay, dead people voting. Okay, first you get an application, and a, a person who is alive has to apply. Okay, using the name of the deceased, John Doe, uh, Jane Doe, whatever. Then it has to go to the clerk's office. It gets processed by the clerk's office. They send you an application. You re-sign the application. You send it back. Then you get your ballot. It's like, wait a minute. I mean, it's not just, this is complete fraud at its highest honor. Because it's not that, I I mean, for a dead person to get a ballot and for it to actually get counted, you have to go through a lot of steps. This is just criminality at its finest moment. Absolute, absolute intentional crime. crime. To actually use someone else's ID to vote. It's identification fraud. It's voter fraud. And why it's not being talked about. It's a bunch of things. And a lot of people got to be involved in order to make it happen. Yeah. Well. Correct. (laughs) Nowadays, you can go directly online and check out whether or not someone's registered to vote and get a copy of their their voter ID. It's not that hard to do anymore. There was a, there was a link. 
Um, I think I posted this in your in your Facebook, and I'm not sure, but there was a link. It was in Cook County, and and of course it's Cook County, and somewhere it's somewhere just north of Chicago, where if you voted for John Doe, okay, now the, the they the person went into the machine, voted for John Doe, and then looked at the ballot. It, it came out Jane Doe. Mm. So basically, if you were voting for one person, it came out the other. Imagine that. Well, yeah, we've, we've talked about how the machines can be hacked and how the votes can be changed. So that's something everyone's going to be looking at come November 8th. We're down to our last five minutes. It's time to exit out of here. We will be back here on, um, what is today? Today's Friday? Today is Friday, right? Yeah, today it is. is Friday. All right, well, next week we got Jeffries. Uh, I'm sorry, get his name backwards. Stefan Jeffries is going to be returning. Uh, he was fun, so much fun to talk with. And Mike Cutler. Our friend about immigration, my guy that I've known forever, he's going to be talking about refugee, refugee resettlement, immigration, and all the mess we're into. Uh, but we're down to our last few minutes here, and I want to thank you, Michael, for joining us. Uh, thank you all that were in the chat room. You all put up some great comments, Bigfoot, uh, Golf, uh, my friend Cal, as well as Vito Esposito, Mamma Mia, No Sharia. So I ask everyone, be out there, be safe, be happy. And we will see you next week. Until then, Curtis, we say good night and God bless. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. George? Yeah. Yeah, hi. I'm sorry. Yeah. We, we couldn't have you more on the show. Uh, Jennifer just kind of was on a hot roll. And you know how it is. I you know. Just sit back. You sit back and let her go. <laughs> That's all right. We'll come back. She was wonderful. I didn't want to stop her either. I was <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be talking to you over the weekend, and I'll see what I, openings I got because I've got a couple of All people right. looking for the next few days, but maybe just before election on on the first of November. That'll be great. I'm actually on a road trip. We're going from Louisiana. We saw Elbert Guillory. Uh, now we're on to Texas to see Lori Bartley, and then we're on to Colorado. Oh, so well, we're going to touch base with everybody before the before uh, election day. Well, you travel safely then. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Take Thanks, Sam. Thanks. This is the most transparent administration in history. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Fact is, we have four dead Americans. What difference at this point does it make? If you've got a business, you didn't build that.
Thank you for sitting with us.